The Bag by H. H. Munro, Saki, 1870-1916 The Major is coming in to tea, said Mrs. Hoopington to her niece. He's just gone round to the stables with his horse. Be as bright and lively as you can. The poor man's got a fit of the glooms. Major Pallaby was a victim of circumstances over which he had no control, and of his temper over which he had very little. He had taken on the mastership of the Pexdale Hounds in succession to a highly popular man who had fallen foul of his committee, and the Major found himself confronted with the overt hostility of at least half the hunt while his lack of tact and amiability had done much to alienate the remainder. Hence subscriptions were beginning to fall off, foxes grew provokingly scarcer, and wire obtruded itself with increasing frequency. The Major could plead reasonable excuse for his fit of the glooms. In ranging herself as a partisan on the side of Major Pallaby, Mrs. Hoofington had been largely influenced by the fact that she had made up her mind to marry him at an early date. Against his notorious bad temper, she set his three thousand a year and his prospective succession to a baronetcy gave a casting vote in his favour. The Major's plans on the subject of matrimony were not at present in such an advanced stage as Mrs. Hoopington's. But he was beginning to find his way over to Hupington Hall with a frequency that was already being commented on. He had a wretchedly thin field out again yesterday, said Mrs. Hoopington. Why you didn't bring one or two hunting men down with you instead of that stupid Russian boy, I can't think. Vladimir isn't stupid, protested her niece. He's one of the most amusing boys I ever met. Just compare him for a moment with some of your heavy hunting men. Anyhow, my dear Nora, he can't ride. Russians never can, but he shoots. Yes, and what does he shoot? Yesterday he brought home a woodpecker in his game bag. But he'd shot three pheasants and some rabbits as well. That's no excuse for including a woodpecker in his game bag. Foreigners go in for mixed bags more than we do. A grand duke pots a vulture just as seriously as we should stalk a bustard. Anyhow, I've explained to Vladimir that certain birds are beneath his dignity as a sportsman. And as he's only nineteen, of course his dignity is a sure thing to appeal to. Mrs. Hoopington sniffed. Most people with whom Vladimir came in contact found his high spirits infectious, but his present hostess was guaranteed immune against infection of that sort. "'I hear him coming in now,' she observed. "'I shall go and get ready for tea. "'We're going to have it here in the hall. "'Entertain the Major if he comes in before I'm down, "'and, above all, be bright.' Nora was dependent on her aunt's good graces for many little things that made life worth living and she was conscious of a feeling of discomfiture because the Russian youth whom she had brought down as a welcome element of change in the country house routine was not making a good impression. That young gentleman, however, was supremely unconscious of any shortcomings and burst into the hall, tired and less sprucely groomed than usual, but distinctly radiant. His game bag looked comfortably full, "'Guess what I've shot?' he demanded. "'Pheasants, wood pigeons, rabbits?' hazarded Nora. "'No, a large beast. "'I don't know what you call it in English. "'Brown with a darkish tail.' Nora changed colour. "'Does it live in a tree and eat nuts?' she asked, "'hoping that the use of the adjective large "'might be an exaggeration.' "'Vladimir laughed. Oh, no, not a bayelka. Does it swim and eat fish? asked Nora, with a fervent prayer in her heart that it might turn out to be an otter. No, said Vladimir, busy with the straps of his game bag. 
It lives in the woods and eats rabbits and chickens. Nora sat down suddenly and hid her face in her hands. Merciful heaven, she wailed. He shot a fox. Vladimir looked up at her in consternation. In a torrent of agitated words, she tried to explain the horror of the situation. The boy understood nothing, but was thoroughly alarmed. Hide it, hide it, said Nora frantically, pointing to the still unopened bag. My aunt and the major will be here in a moment. Throw it on the top of that chest. They won't see it there. Vladimir swung the bag with fair aim, but the strap caught in its flight on the outstanding point of an antler fixed in the wall, and the bag, with its terrible burden, remained suspended just above the alcove where tea would presently be laid. At that moment Mrs. Hoopington and the Major entered the hall. "'The Major is going to draw our covers tomorrow,' announced the lady, with a certain heavy satisfaction. "'Smithers is confident that we will be able to show him some sport. He swears he's seen a fox in the nut copse three times this week.' "'I'm sure I hope so. I hope so,' said the Major moodily. "'I must break this sequence of blank days. "'One hears so often that a fox has settled down "'as a tenant for life in certain covers, "'and then when you go to turn him out, "'there isn't a trace of him. "'I'm certain a fox was shot or trapped "'in Lady Widden's woods the very day before we drew them. "'Major, if anyone tried that game on in my woods,' "'They'd get short shrift,' said Mrs. Hoopington. Nora found her way mechanically to the tea-table and made her fingers frantically busy in rearranging the parsley round the sandwich-dish. On one side of her loomed the morose countenance of the Major, on the other she was conscious of the scared, miserable eyes of Vladimir. And above it all hung that— she dared not raise her eyes above the level of the tea-table, and she almost expected to see a spot of accusing vulpine blood drip down and stain the whiteness of the cloth. Her aunt's manner signalled to her the repeated message to be bright, for the present she was fully occupied in keeping her teeth from chattering. "'What did you shoot to-day?' asked Mrs. Hoopington of the unusually silent Vladimir. "'Nothing, nothing worth speaking of,' said the boy. Nora's heart, which had stood still for a space, made up for lost time with a most disturbing bound. "'I wish you'd find something that was worth speaking about,' said the hostess. "'Everyone seems to have lost their tongues.' "'When did Smithers last see that fox?' said the Major." "'Yesterday morning, a fine dog-fox with a dark brush,' confided Mrs. Hoopington. "'Aha! We'll have a good gallop after that brush tomorrow," said the Major, with a transient gleam of good humour. And then the gloomy silence settled again round the tea-table, a silence broken only by despondent munchings and the occasional feverish rattle of a teaspoon in its saucer. A diversion was at last afforded by Mrs. Hoopington's fox terrier, which had jumped on to a vacant chair, the better to survey the delicacies of the table, and was now sniffing in an upward direction at something apparently more interesting than cold tea-cake. "'What is exciting him?' asked his mistress, as the dog suddenly broke into short, angry barks, with a running accompaniment of tremulous whines. "'Why,' she continued, "'it's your game-bag, Vladimir. What have you got in it?' "'By gad,' said the Major, who was now standing up, "'there's a pretty warm scent.' And then a simultaneous idea flashed on himself and Mrs. Hoopington. Their faces flushed to distinct but harmonious tones of purple, and with one accusing voice they screamed, "'You shot the fox!' Nora tried hastily to palliate Vladimir's misdeed in their eyes, but it is doubtful whether 
they heard her the major's fury clothed and reclothed itself in words as frantically as a woman up in town for one day's shopping tries on a succession of garments he reviled and railed at fate and the general scheme of things he pitied himself with a strong deep pity too poignant for tears he condemned every one with whom he had ever come in contact to endless and abnormal punishments in fact he conveyed the impression that if a destroying angel had been lent to him for a week it would have had very little time for private study in the lulls of his outcry could be heard the querulous monotone of mrs hoopington and the sharp staccato barking of the fox terrier vladimir who did not understand a tithe of what was being said sat fondling a cigarette and repeating under his breath from time to time a vigorous english adjective which he had long ago taken affectionately into his vocabulary his mind strayed back to the youth in the old russian folk-tale who shot an enchanted bird with dramatic results meanwhile the major roaming round the hall like an imprisoned cyclone had caught sight of and joyfully pounced on the telephone apparatus and lost no time in ringing up the hunt secretary and announcing his resignation of the membership a servant had by this time brought his horse round to the door and in a few seconds mrs hoopington's shrill monotone had the field to itself but after the major's display her best efforts at vocal violence missed their full effect and it was as though one had come straight out from a wagner opera into a rather tame thunderstorm realizing perhaps that her tirades were something of an anticlimax, mrs hoopington broke suddenly into some rather unnecessary tears and marched out of the room leaving behind her a silence almost as terrible as the turmoil which had preceded it what shall i do with that asked vladimir at last bury it said nora just plain burial said vladimir rather relieved he had almost expected that some of the local clergy would have insisted on being present or that a salute might have to be fired over the grave and thus it came to pass that in the dusk of a november evening the russian boy murmuring a few of the prayers of his church for luck gave hasty but decent burial to a large polecat under the lilac trees at hoopington <laughs>